Did you know that Echo Park is a culturally diverse neighborhood in Los Angeles, popular with artists, musicians, and creatives? We'll discuss this and other interesting facts about the intersection of race, gender, culture, and citizenship with writer and scholar Dr. Natalia Molina on this episode of The Curious Professor. I'm Dr. B. Welcome to the Curious Professor podcast, where I take listeners on a journey of discovery to explore the people, places, artifacts, and natural wonders that spark my curiosity. On this episode of the Curious Professor podcast, we'll explore race and culture in the United States with author and historian Dr. Natalia Molina. But first, a trivia question. What is a MacArthur Fellowship? I'll have the answer for you at the end of this episode. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Natalia Molina on the show today. Dr. Molina is a distinguished professor in the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. She is currently serving as Interim Director of Research at the Huntington, temporarily stepping down from its Board of Governors while a search for a new director is underway. Her own research explores the intertwined histories of race, place, gender, culture, and citizenship. She is the author of several award-winning books and has been published widely in scholarly journals. She's written for the LA Times, Washington Post, and San Diego Union Tribune. Professor Molina is a 2020 MacArthur Fellow. When I learned about Natalia's passion for history and culture, my curiosity was immediately piqued and I wanted to learn more. I hope this interview with Natalia will spark your curiosity too. Welcome to the show, Natalia. It's great to have you here. I'm so glad to be here, Karen. Thank you. What's the most interesting thing about you? I'm a very structured person. You know, I have routines and schedules. And I think because of that, it allows me a lot of freedom. I'm a very curious person. And so, you know, as professors, people think that, you know, what you do as a professor is is you teach and you do. Um, But just like attorneys aren't in court all day long. They're also writing briefs and researching and looking things up. We're lesson planning, but we're also doing our research and we're writing. And we do this thing called service. You know, when you think of how does the university run? Yes, there are administrators, but there are a lot of professors on committees. But there's all these moments that I found early on to to be curious. So um, I started doing administration right after I got tenure. And the first time, the first position I looked into was just, I just called just to, you know, when you used to call people, shows how old I am. I just picked up the phone and called. I saw this ad for a study abroad director. And so I wanted to know how I could build up the skills to be eligible for it, not for that go around, but for a later go around. And luckily the president or the head of the study abroad program for the entire UC system talked to me and he said, why don't you apply now? And I was in my 30s and I had a child and I'm like, well, because you have, you have to be you know, far along in your career. And he said, you have to be tenured and you're tenured. And I said, well, because you have to be near retirement because that's a lot of the study abroad directors I, I need were in that position. No, and finally, I'm like, you have to be like a older white man with like a, a like a blazer with the patches. Like I just had this idea and I realized I had my own gendered idea, maybe not a a professor because I knew I was a professor, but at least a professor who was a leader for study abroad. And so he said, it sounds like you're eligible. Why don't you try it? And it was the best experience. I hadn't done that as a student and I got to travel and try new things and I loved being with the students. It was kind of like being in a res- as a red- residential advisor almost. I'd never lived in a dorm. Yeah, it just, it op- and that is experience that opened up a world of possibilities for me because I do U.S. history. You know, we don't have conferences abroad. I don't have to go to archives in Paris like some of my colleagues 
But after that, I just started looking for opportunities. So I've given talks all over the world. I've done residencies all over the world. It's just been this unexpected pleasure of being a professor and and just knowing people. And And it's improved my work because when you do something like U.S. history or American studies, well, there are people that do that abroad. Just like we study China in the U.S. or we study Latin America, people in China and Latin America study us. And so you get to go talk about U.S. history from a scholar trained in China and that under and can read Chinese sources about migration of Chinese to the U.S. So, yeah, I think. I guess that's one of the, the things that I've enjoyed the most and maybe somebody would think was interesting. And what was the most fascinating place that you've traveled to? Cuba would be one. I mean, I think they're all, they're all fascinating in their own way. So I'll say Cuba and China. Both my trips were, were close to each other. So the first going to Cuba that in the U.S. we don't go to Cuba. Because, you know, we've had this embargo since Kennedy was president. And then I went when Obama, right up, right when Donald Trump was elected. So we still had the Obama regulations when it was loosening up. And you go and you think like, oh, it's going to be Cuba. It's going to be like this, this time capsule. And there are certainly moments of that because they can't get many of the things we have. Even things like if they study medicine, they don't have access to certain journals because even those like there's restrictions so like when you think about looking up a journal article online or because of patents they don't have access to certain medicines so there was definitely that of course the old cars all that kind of thing but there's another part where like people from the u.s are the only ones that can't freely go there so there's all this investment from europe a lot of canadians that are visiting so tourism is huge there and also U.S. cruise ships stop there, right? Because there are like seven reasons why you can go. And one of them is like on a humanitarian mission. And apparently if you sign up for a certain cruise and they'll they'll give you that visa form that you can say it's a humanitarian mission. So that was really interesting. It was interesting to see the kind of the, the hustle of when you need to do things, um, when you need to survive. So we went on this one tour and the tour guide spoke English, but they hadn't been to college and that's usually where people learn English so I asked them how they spoke English and it turns out they also spoke some French German Italian and it was that the boss who was one of their their uncles when Obama was opening regulations to Cuba said we're going to build up some tourism here in our on our farm it was just a farm they grew tobacco and he said we're going to build up some tourism here you're going to learn who are the two smartest people you 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 learn English and they got them a tutor and they learned English in order to open a business. And that kind of hustle you don't see everywhere. And then that was in October. And I think in June is when I was um, selected as a, one of the fellows that would go to China through my professional organization, the Organization of American Historians. And that was just a whole different kind of communism. That was like communism on capitalist you know, steroids. So much consumerism, so much uh, wealth, so much uh, tourism, but only for certain people. And so you just think Cuba, that was communism. China, this is communism. And they feel completely different. In 2020, you were awarded a MacArthur Fellowship for your work on race and citizenship. Can you tell us more about that award? So the MacArthur Fellowship is interestingly not for your past work but for your future work and so they pick people that they think have a good strong track record and that can can still keep going right um because i have one friend who was like are you gonna retire now because it comes with a good chunk of change (laughs) i was like well no i mean most days I don't think about it, right? Because most days we all do, or, you know, I think a lot of professors, they love teaching, they love researching. Writing can be challenging, but it feels good to, to have written. Um, what's interesting to me about getting awarded the MacArthur is what I got awarded for. So when I started this, uh, my research, I was really interested in the ways in which the lives of one immigrant or racial group, what I call racialized groups, because race and ethnicity can change over time. Um, Our ideas about race and ethnicity, sometimes Mexicans are called an ethnicity, sometimes they're called a race, sometimes they're called white, sometimes they're called uh, white but Hispanic, all these different things. And so I try to show that it's an active 
process by talking about it as a racialized group. So when I first started, most people, you know, they're used to this, right? Um, ethnic studies being Latino studies, Asian American studies, African American studies, indigenous studies. In the same way, we have like Black History Month, Women's History Month, Hispanic Heritage Month. So everything kind of is in its own silo. And I was really interested, but how do they come together? And I don't necessarily mean like, how do people, how do African Americans and Latino Americans protest together? I was really interested in so much of how we think about citizenship in the US is framed by notions of blackness, you know, slavery, the 14th amendment, Brown v. Board. How do these serve as these kind of what I call scripts for then how other groups are introduced? One example of this is during the pandemic. I think I did my first pandemic interview before it was even declared a pandemic. And it was around Asian Americans and the violence that they were experiencing because people were blaming COVID arising out of China on Asian Americans here in LA, or, you know, just these communities that hadn't been to China, but it, this stereotype. And so people asked, are you surprised? And my answer was always no. You know, reporters always want to know, are you surprised? Or is this because we used to say they were diseased, you know, in, in the eight, late 1800s. And yes, you can talk about how there were these stereotypes about Chinese and they weren't allowed citizenship and they weren't allowed to naturalize. And then those uh, ideas got transferred onto Japanese and they couldn't own or lease land and they were incarcerated. Uh, they couldn't intermarry. They couldn't buy land wherever they wanted or go to school wherever they wanted. So we could talk about all that. But along with that, there was also a parallel stream of this happening with Mexicans. So all those kind of scripts were also applied to Mexicans as they started to immigrate in larger numbers with the Mexican Revolution, with the development of agriculture in the West. There would be public health exams, and they would only be directed at those coming from Mexico, never those going into Mexico. They would only be directed at Mexican bodies coming from Mexico, never white American bodies who had visited Mexico. So this idea of disease, right, was kind of, and who is a disease carrier and what places are disease carriers? Chinatowns, barrios, but not the, the port in LA, the harbor in LA when plague hits LA and they find these, these rats carrying the plague at the port. So disease was uh, affected, only affected certain people and certain spaces in, in this kind of, you know, um, in these cases. And so to me, it was that you needed to look at not just the way that Asians and medical racialization had happened, but how it had happened with Latinos and how these two inform each other. You can almost picture two timelines and then you can kind of picture merging them. When I first started this work, I was told, hmm, interesting. Nope, we're not going to do that. Everybody stays in their lane. You do Latino studies or you do Asian American studies. You do African American studies or you do indigenous studies. We don't look at this racial racialization um, and the way that one informs the other. It's it's too too much. So please cut out the the Asians from your book on public health and race called Fit to Be Citizens. And I said, no, that's kind of the way I think, and I just can't picture it otherwise. I'll I'll just go to another press. That. You know, you fast forward almost 20 years and I get this MacArthur Award because I look at the, this historical construction of race and citizenship and and uh, what I call racial scripts. So something that back then was seen as like too new now is being recognized as, oh, wait a minute. This is how we live our lives, right? This is how you go to work, you you go to school. You marry, you you know, live in neighborhoods, you're around people that are different than yourself. And so we need to understand what this all means. So you are way ahead of your time by two decades, it sounds like. It's a nice way to think about it then. Back when, when I first had my book rejected, it was very sad, but it is kind of nice to know that people, and you know, people are, are using these, these theories now. Um, one of my students is doing this fascinating project on Vietnamese fishermen in the Gulf, like in, you know, the Houston area. And you just think like they're refugees, they're newcomers, they're trying to come up with a business. Well, it's this case of, of the Ku Klux Klan going after these Vietnamese fishermen because they're seen as 
undermining their water. It's their water. And these Vietnamese fisher people are using, they have an unfair advantage because they're willing to sell and eat parts of the of the fish or the shrimp that other people wouldn't. And it's it's like the same kind of conversation that hundred happened a hundred years ago with Japanese and the alien land law acts when they saw Japanese farmers were being too successful. Well, they have these unfair ways of doing it. So we're just going to make sure they can't own or lease land for more than three years. And so it's this way in which you think about the South and the KKK around, you know, policing blackness, but you see that those same scripts can then be put onto this new group, Vietnamese refugees. You just answered three of my questions at once. So I'm <laughs> looking down my list, which is great. I always love it when guests do my work for me. So it's wonderful. So in the United States, why are some groups seen as more able to assimilate while others are not? One of the things that I always tell my student is whatever argument you're making about race and how we think about race or that we create policies or you know regulations around race, ask what's at stake. And I think one of the ways that you can see this really well is that, and this gets to how active that process of racialization is. So why are some seen as more assimilable, and that's always a hard word to say, more or less than another group? So if I go back to the example of the Japanese farmers, they're seen as less assimilable. Everyone is telling, every expert is telling you this. And this is what I mean about institutionalizing our ideas about race, that it's not just that people are discriminating against them, but the actual policies are discriminating against them. So even if someone's not there to actively discriminate it against them, there's a way in which they're put in their place. And so what, what are the policies, what are the, the institutions that can do that? Well, you have immigration officials that say the only people that can naturalize are whites and blacks, and blacks only because of the 14th Amendment. So Japanese, you cannot naturalize. You cannot become citizens. Then you have uh, the Supreme Court when Japanese try to challenge that. And you have uh, the Ozawa case in 1922, where you have a Japanese man that his case makes it all the way to the Supreme Court. And he says, you know, I speak English. My whole family dresses in Western wear. We're church going, we're Christians. I'm a successful businessman in every way. I'm an American. You know, look at Benedict Anderson. He got to be a citizen, but in his heart, he was not an American. In my heart, I am an American. Make me a citizen. And the Supreme Court says, yeah, sorry, but because you're, you know, Asian, it's science tells us you're not, you're not eligible. And so then the next year, then Bhagat Thin comes up who's South Asian and he's like, Oh, science? Science gets to be the arbiter of citizenship? Aha. Uh-huh. I am South Asian. We are Caucasian, according to these anthropological trees. Um, I am going to say then I get citizenship. I mean, I graduated from Berkeley. I, I was in the war. All these things that I've done. And they say, oh, you passed the your good point, Then You did pass the scientist test, but you didn't pass the common man test. And the common man, the average man on the street would look at you and look at your dark skin and say, nope, not American. So sorry, we can't make you a citizen. And so you have all these ways in which we deem certain groups unassimilable. And in the case of Japanese during this time period is when we see how successful they're being in their businesses and in their farming. On the contrary, we have Mexicans who now we would think, oh, people are we're probably arguing they aren't assimilable. Au contraire, my friend, this is why we come to this podcast to learn these kinds of things, right? We need workers at this time. The Southwest is developing its agricultural systems. We need people to work on the railroads. And so we say, you know, Mexicans, we can teach them English. Uh, We can help the, the mothers learn how to cook Americanized food. We can send the kids to school. And... A lot of them go back to Mexico after the agricultural season is over. They're birds of passage anyway. This group is assimilable. Fast forward 20 years and we have the depression. Something else is at stake. There are no jobs. We don't need that same Mexican workforce. And all of a sudden, 
that same group that we saw as unassimilable has now become a biological threat. They're more prone to tuberculosis. They're less likely to birth healthy babies. They have higher infant mortality rates. Something else is at stake. And so you see that sometimes it's both, you know, you have a group like Japanese and Mexicans at the same time, one is seen as more similar and one is less. And then at other times, that same group, depending on what time period you look at, at them at, they're more or less assimilable. That's how we see that race is socially constructed. That's how we see that groups are racialized and they change over time. I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk about the Mexican restaurant in Echo Park, which is called Nayarit. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And you said that it was a place where people could become visible once again, where they could speak out, claim space and belong. Can you tell us more about that? Well, you know what it's like to be a professor. Sometimes you're, you know, telling your students these stories and they're like, that's so depressing. I mean, here I just told you about these immigration acts and these public health policies. And yet I also know that we have joy in our lives and we don't always get to hear that side of the immigrant story, especially for Mexicans, especially historically, because if you try to tell that story, it's mainly told through archives. And those archives are told from the people who were making those rules. So courts and police officers and teachers and social workers and settlement house workers. And yet I knew from growing up in my grandmother's restaurant that there are also places that I call urban anchors in the book that are kind of these safe harbors for immigrants. You know, they're not utopias, but they are these places where immigrants can get a foothold. And so for my grandmother, who started the Nayari in 1951 in Echo Park on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, she was able to come here, like those Mexicans I just told you, you know, fleeing the Mexican Revolution in the early 1920s, and establish a restaurant. She was by herself, and she didn't speak English, and she wanted a restaurant that could then serve as a foothold for other immigrants, an urban anchor. And so she created the Nayari. And she hired attorneys to help her write letters to her immigrant friends and family members in Mexico that said, if you give them a visa, they'll get to come here and they'll work in my restaurant. And because it was in a what I call a cultural crossroads and a geographic crossroads, Echo Park, it also wasn't like in an ethnic enclave. And so there were a lot of different people that went there. You know, the, the core clientele what were Mexicans, but they were also, you know, movie stars that came after their shows, musicians that came after performing, Dodger players that went after baseball games, people that had been to downtown to see a play or a concert at the music center came. So it became a, both an urban anchor for ethnic Mexicans, as well as this thriving cultural hub. And so that's why I call my grandmother and immigrants like her placemakers. We're used to seeing, when we think about like what are the main anchors in a community, we think of like hospitals and schools and libraries, and certainly those are important, but those are official. I'm really interested in the unofficial places that these placemakers create, these urban anchors. Can you just state the title of that book for the listeners who want to learn more about that? It's called A Place at the Nayari, How a Mexican Community Nourished a Community, uh, How a Mexican Restaurant Nourished a Community. And I will also say that um, I'm developing curriculum for it because the point for me in writing this book was I want everybody to do a history of their urban anchor. I know not everybody will write their book, but I would love a teacher to be able to teach this to fourth graders where they can like have like a list of 10 questions that they can go ask at their favorite Armenian restaurant or their favorite Persian restaurant or their favorite pizza spot. And then maybe, you know, in the sixth grade or seventh grade, eighth grade, they scale up and they look up a redlining map that you can find out online and see how was this neighborhood shaped by uh, redlining forces when the government came in and assessed certain areas of, of worthy and, and certain areas of not worthy for investment in the 1930s. And it has a long legacy. And then I kind of keep adding layers for each grade and for the university and you know ideas on how people can share this. It might be a TikTok or an Instagram, it might be a poster board, 
It might be uh, scalar or story mapping. Just depends what age you're trying to teach this to and what tools you have at your disposal and how much time you have. That's wonderful. I love it. Where can listeners find out more about you? I am at Natalia Molina, PhD.com. That's my website. And that's where you have everything. You can find my Twitter and Instagram handles, prof underscore Natalia M. At the bottom, you can sign up for my newsletter because I'm always learning. Just like you're learning through your podcast. I love to hear people's stories when they come to my book readings And so I write about those. I always include a moment of joy because we need joy in our lives also. So nataliamolinaphd.com. It was great to have you on the show, Natalia. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Curious Professor podcast. Thank you for such a carefully crafted interview. I really appreciate your time. And now for the answer to this episode's trivia question. What is a MacArthur Fellowship? The MacArthur Fellows Program, also known as the MacArthur Fellowship and commonly referred to as the Genius Grant, is a prize awarded annually by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation to U.S. citizens or residents working in any field who have shown extraordinary originality and dedication in their creative pursuits and a marked capacity for self-direction. We'll end the show with something punny. What is a professor's favorite snack? Academia nuts, except for math professors, they love pie. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Curious Professor podcast. If there's a person, place, artifact, or natural wonder that has sparked your curiosity and you'd like for me to feature it on the show, please let me know. My website is thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe to The Curious Professor Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to become part of my community of curiosity seekers, be sure to visit my website, thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com, and join Dr. B's Hive. Until next time, always be learning and be curious with Dr. B.